will also be going to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which is the headquarters of the Institute of the International Institute of Restorative Practices. I'll be heading to Belgium next month in May for a, an international conference on restorative practices and looking at some community projects there. Um, and that's all I know we have on tap so far. I, we may be shooting in the UK, but I don't know yet if that's if we're going to be able to do that. Well, um, explain to our listeners a little bit about what you mean by restorative practices and exactly how they uh, work and everything. And also, like we said, we were talking earlier to our first guest about um, digital democracy. So I was just curious if there was any parallel between what's going on in the world of happening in the digital world and these kind of restorative practices. So in a way to kind of like connect the two together, but you just explain to our listeners a little bit about what restorative work is. Sure. Um, Restorative practices, restorative justice is a field that developed, I would say in the early 1970s and it has many branches and tentacles um, and people practice it in different ways. I'm working with Ted Wachtell, who is the founder of Restorative Practices and the the International Institute for Restorative Practices in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He and his wife um, sort of started as a result of their work with um, youth group homes and working with troubled teens and working in the school system. And so one, one of the most commonly practiced restorative practice is what's called a circle. And you need at least like three people to start, but you can have more than three. And basically what it is is someone sort of facilitates the circle and they'll ask a question and they'll go to the left or to the right and everyone has a turn to answer the question and no one speaks or no one interrupts while that person is expressing themselves. And it can um, it can have both proactive and um, and reactive purposes. So in a proactive circle like we um, experienced in Detroit, um, there was a teacher who was working with middle school students. And what she was trying to do is kind of get the, you know how your middle school years are, everything is a big deal. And then you're dealing with people, young people who are living in um, under-resourced, Uh, high crime areas and they have a lot of emotions that they bring to the schoolhouse doors before they can even learn. So restorative practices enables them to process their emotions so they can get to the academics. And so the teacher will ask a question like, um, you know, how are you doing today? Use one word to describe how you're feeling today. And everybody will go around the circle and they'll tell how they feel. And if there's more follow-up needed after the circle is complete, the teacher will say, well, you know, James, you said that you were feeling frustrated today. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And so what that does is it gives young people a voice. It affirms them. It affirms that they are important and that they matter and that their lives and their actions matter. And what that also does is it gives them a sense of responsibility because one of the the under the, the underlying premise of restorative practices is that you know people are a lot happier and are more apt to make positive change when you do things with them rather to or for them and so in a school setting if you have children students who feel affirmed that their voice matters that they have a say in their education rather than educating to them or for them, then you might see better and positive results. And we did actually, one of the things we got to film while we were in Detroit is after the teacher did the the restorative circle with the middle school students, one of the students, uh, a young woman named Naya, young girl named Naya had come up to the teacher and asked her if she could talk to her after class. And um, she allowed Cassidy Freeman, who is my documentary filmmaker, director, filmmaker, um, collaborator, he and I sat in on the session between Naya and the teacher whose name is Rhonda. And it was like middle school stuff. I mean, it wasn't a major problem, but the teacher used a series of questions. They're often scripted questions um, that if you go through the training, you pretty much memorize and um, talk the student through what her issues were. And uh, as I said, it was like middle school stuff, like, oh, my friends aren't listening to me. They think I'm too sensitive. But anyway, the student felt affirmed, 
And once she walked out of the classroom, Rhonda, the teacher, turned to me and with tears in her eyes said, she chose me. She chose me to talk to. And then I started crying and seeing, like, the joy that this teacher had in having a set of tools to reach her students and to really communicate with them. Yeah, because I'm thinking that one of the things that I know that we've even talked about on this show before is the ways that the school systems have changed and just the nature of schools. And I remember growing up and going to school in, uh, well, grade school in the 70s and uh, graduating high school in the 80s and then even into college. But it seems to me that back in those days, teachers were more engaged with their students. So a lot of this kind of stuff that you're talking about, it seems like it was more common, say, in the 70s and definitely in my parents' generation. And I was wondering if that's what you were finding as well, that maybe there's some sort of we've had a recent disconnect where the teachers aren't necessarily connecting like they used to with the teachers, I mean, with the students, because that's what seems like is going on. I was just wondering if that's what you've been picking up on. Well, yes, but I think it's a larger society-wide issue. I think that we need to use restorative practices to heal our relationships with each other. We have broken relationships, and we need to know how to repair them. And, and I'm saying this is a lone wolf single woman, no children, who my way of dealing with conflict is to avoid it altogether. So I'm talking about myself as much as I'm talking about anybody else. But I think our schools reflect what are happening, what's happening in our homes, in our communities. Um, but the teacher, the teacher being involved in the, with the student in that way, and that there's time carved out during the day, so the teacher's not worried about, well, you know, I need to get their test scores up. She's worried about the relationships that she has with her students, and she's cultivating that because she knows that once she tends to the relationships, that the academics will easily follow. Yeah, because it's really interesting that you bring that up because I know that sometimes some of the best meetings that I have gone to, because um, I a, belong to a couple of boards. I belong to the board of the Kelly Theater. I belong to a couple of other boards. But it seems to me that the best boards that I have gone to are actually board meetings that start off with kind of what you're talking about. They start off with like some sort of practice or some sort of connecting event that gets the people engaged in connecting with each other before they even get to the meat and potato issues of whatever is on the plate of the board. So there might be some sort of like, you know, what was your, what happened to you that uh, was significant this week? It might be something as simple as that, but they're these kind of like icebreaker kind of things that then get you engaged in the process. And I was wondering if more of our school shouldn't even do that when they are bringing the kids into the classroom. Cause I sometimes think, and I could be wrong that a lot of times the teachers just automatically go into the, format of teaching whatever that um, agenda is for the day without necessarily engaging the kids. And uh, But when you go to the corporate world or even the meeting world, like I was saying with the board, we seem to do a better job of engaging because we know that that's how people would do a better job of being able to deal with whatever you're dealing with in terms of the issues that are being brought up. Well, we saw circles being happening in the court system in in Detroit, Michigan. So we saw we went to the third court, uh, the third circuit court in Detroit, and Cassie and I filmed a group of staff members who were engaging. Now, this was more in a supportive um, circle where they were basically the heads of their various departments, and they had all been ret- trained in restorative practices. And they were talking about how do they use restorative practices when when dealing with staff conflicts and with dealing with home conflicts. So, I mean, it's used everywhere. It's not just schools, but we've seen it in the court circuit. What it does is it, it creates a safe space, and that safe space allows other things to happen. So if you create a safe space, because we think about the court system, you're seeing people on their worst day, whether it's a parking ticket or they've been accused of a crime or convicted of a crime, it's on their worst day. So if you have trained personnel who are there and their purpose, in addition to doing their job, is focused on repairing harm, restoring relationships, building social capital, it just makes things that much better. Um, We've seen um, in Detroit people creating restorative spaces. So one of my favorite stories from Detroit is this man named Coach Gonzalez 
um, who works at the post office. I'm not sure if he's a mail carrier or what he does. But he comes in after a full day of work, and he trains, like, 10 kids from ages 8 to 18 in boxing. And and that boxing ring, believe it or not, becomes a restorative space because it's a safe space where the kids are working out their problems. In the beginning, they, they kind of do the um, warm-up exercises, and they're even in a circle, and he's talking to them as they're in that circle. He's checking in with them about how their day went, what's going on in their lives, if there's anything they need to talk to, talk about. So um, we saw that in action. We pulled out one of the students who came in. He was, his name is Jalen, and he just had his, this heaviness about his spirit, and he, he did sort of like he was in that circle, that boxing ring circle with Coach Gonzalez. And you could just see during the course of the afternoon as it, it went into evening, that heaviness lift from him and his ability to sort of work through whatever was going on with him. So um, you can use it in different parts of society, not just schools. It can be used everywhere. Yeah, so like I said, I'll – I think it was either last week or maybe two weeks ago, I have uh, managed somehow, and I don't know how because I'm in my 50s, to avoid the uh, whole concept of jury duty. But I went to jury duty <laughs> recently and wound up sitting there all day long, did not get called for any trial. So now i got a two-year window before they call me again. And who knows, it might be another 50 before they do that. But I kind of wish that there had been some restorative practices going on during that jury duty trial because the, the bulk of that time we were sitting there, I think it was probably me and about another, I would guess, between 40 and 50 people, kind of like just twiddling our thumbs, reading whatever books we had. Ironically, court TV was on in the courts, but that was the other <laughs> thing that was going on that people were doing as part of their uh, own personal restorative practice. But apparently the clerk of courts likes to watch uh, public court TV, which I thought was just hilarious in and of itself. I'm like, like, wait a minute, you deal with courts all day long, but your idea of fun is watching divorce court. I didn't get it, but it wasn't for me to get. Well, I don't have TV in the Mexican jungle, but I'm imagining that divorce court can be pretty entertaining. Yeah, I imagine it can be. Now, would you tell folks how you – now, what is the project that is bringing you to the Mexican jungles? Is that separate from the restorative uh, project, or is this uh, something totally different that's bringing you to the Mexican jungles? Uh, so this is completely different. Um, you know, I have been plotting my escape uh, from the United States since I was about seven years old. And that's when I started to write stories, travel stories about going to London and Paris and solving crimes with my mystery solving friends. Clearly, I was a child of the 80s and watched too, too much Scooby-Doo. Um, but I had always dreamed of traveling and living abroad. And so in 2016, um, I decided to make the break and, and I moved to Mexico. And um, I've lived here. I mean, I'm basically tourist visa, so I have to go back to the United States. And I also have to, I have to travel um, to meet the various requirements. I have to, to leave the country from time to time. But um, I mostly stay in Mexico, and I write um, for CNN. I'm a culture contributor, and um, I write for food and travel um, apps, blogs, websites, and I have private clients. And I'm imagining the food has got to be very rich and very good over there in Mexico. I know that I'm a big fan of Mexican food, so I'm thinking that you probably are having some really good experiences while you were there. But uh, since it's the jungles of Mexico, it might even be a different kind of experience. <laughs> well, I live in the Yucatan. I live in the Yucatan Peninsula about two hours south of Cancun. So the beach is about a 15-minute walk from me. Um, 10, 15 minute walk from me. And so when I wake up in the morning, I see the jungles and then uh, on the right side and then on the left side, it's more of a developed area. Now, just out of curiosity, because I've had some friends that have thought about doing this. I have one friend that was waiting. Now, you have the advantage of you're single, so you don't have to deal with it. I would have that advantage as well to some degree. But um, I was wondering, I've got friends that are like one friend wanted to move to, I think they wanted to move to either Colombia or Brazil or one of the South American countries and they've actually looked at it and it looks like they were on the way to moving but then life got in the way their kids had to go graduate from high school and now I think they got to graduate from college and things of that nature so I was just wondering 
And then I've got another friend in Nevada that's talking about that they would love to just ditch the teaching.